Our second scripture re- reading this morning finishes what Carol started this morning with uh, the uh, with the action or the, the day of Pentecost. So, as we read before, the Spirit has come upon those gathered in Jerusalem, and through the power and and uh, through the power of the Spirit. Peter stands up and preaches, and he, he read from the prophet Joel, quoted from the prophet Joel, and now he finishes his sermon. So hear now Peter's sermon, starting in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you know, what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I have made your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ." When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, maybe as you've seen in the back of our archway, uh, we have vacation Bible school coming up this week. And as we've been preparing uh, for VBS, we have a, a sports-themed vacation Bible school this year. I, I can't help but begin to reminisce about the time I was in high school and the sports that I didn't necessarily participate in, but that I uh, remember going to. I, mean, I went to almost every basketball and football game in high school. Now, granted, I was the filmer, so I kind of had to be there. But, uh, but I remember going and, see, and watching those games quite fondly. Now, Stanton sports weren't exactly the best teams around. I will, I, will, I will admit that. But they were good enough and they won enough to at least make every season interesting. They never won any championships, but they at least made things interesting. And of course, if you've been to a high school event or if you've been to a college event or if you've been to a pro event, sports are, are quite the spectacle. Obviously, you have the, the game going on on the court or the field. That's, that's what you're there for. But anymore, there's more and more going on around the, the game as well. Of course, one of the biggest things are the cheerleaders. And I remember, 
at uh, high school games, the, the girls of our class and, and of other class, the high school classes would go and they would cheer on the teams. And one of their biggest moments were, was during timeouts when they would, the teams would gather, huddle up for their timeouts and the cheerleaders would come out and they'd try to you know, rear up the, the crowd and, and get them to be loud and, and cheer loud for their team. One of the cheers that really sticks in my mind even today is the one that goes back and forth between the home team and the opposing team. And maybe you know it pretty well, it's, it's the one, we've got spirit, yes we do, we've got spirit, how about you? And of course we would go back and forth and we'd try to outdo each other, get louder and louder until the teams resume the game. I remember one district basketball game that I was able to attend where the spirit in the crowd, I mean, was just overwhelming. It was off the charts. And of course, well, that cheer was, was used. We've got spirit. Yes, we do. And I remember during, one of the, during the final minute of the game, it was a tie game and there was a timeout. And I mean, the crowd was almost deafening loud. And I mean, chills went up my spine. I couldn't imagine. Now, I didn't play the sport, but I, couldn't, I could imagine this this cheering, this, um, the, the, the fan participation, helping the team, you know, encouraging the team to want to win as, as much as they could, you know, do as much as they could to win the game. This is the type of energy, this is the, the type of power that I imagine the Holy Spirit give, gave the, the apostles on, on Pentecost. If you haven't guessed already, if you haven't heard, today is Pentecost Sunday. The Sunday where we remember and celebrate the the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the early church, empowering them to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, before this, Jesus was still with his disciples, and he promised that before he went back to the right hand of God, that he would send them the Holy Spirit to be with them. Now, the fulfillment of Jesus' promise is what we find here in our text from Acts. Now, this fulfillment of the Holy Spirit coming among the disciples, the apostles, takes place at actually Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish festival. It was a Jewish harvest festival. Now, the term Pentecost is a Greek term meaning 50 or 50th, and it's It's titled that because this this celebration, this harvest celebration, happened 50 days after Passover. So 50 days after the Passover, the Jewish people celebrated the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. So this was a harvest festival. Also during this time, this season of this this festival of Pentecost, Jewish pilgrims from around the known world would journey to Jerusalem and present the first fruits of their harvest or whatever gift they may give before God at the temple. So that is why there are so many different types of people, nationalities represented in Jerusalem at this time. Also during this time, Luke reports in verse 1 of our text that they were, they were all gathered in one place. Now, as me who likes specifics, this is not a very specific verse. Because who exactly are they all? We don't know. And where exactly is this one place? Again, I, I don't know. I'm assuming now at least the uh, 12 apostles were present. Now, obviously, Judas is no longer with them, and in the chapter before this, uh, Judas had been replaced by Matthias. So at least, I think you have the 12, and I think we have to fill in with some history. John Chrysostom, who was a 4th century church scholar, uh, thought that maybe it was the 120 that was gathered in, uh, in the upper room in, in chapter 1, and that's usually the the understanding that we have today. So possibly all of these people were the 120 of the early church gathered. And then all of a sudden, wind and flame come to represent the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now wind and fire are common biblical symbols of the Spirit. The Greek and Hebrew words for spirit can literally mean wind or breath 
That's why here in a few moments we'll sing the song, Breathe on me, breath of God. I think that's the one we're singing, or it's something with the breath of God. So the breath, the wind, and that's also why Jesus, when he talks about the Spirit, talks about the Spirit acting like wind, going to and fro. Unfortunately, we are not able to see, but yet we are still able to experience its presence. Fire is also a symbol of God's presence. And two of the more common uh, stories that involve God's presence in fire is when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and when God led his people Israel out of Egypt by a pillar of fire, both in the book of Exodus. Now Luke reports in verses 3 and 4 that when the Holy Spirit landed on those gathered in the room, they began to to speak various languages, languages that could be understood by the people who were in Jerusalem. And so beginning in verse 5, the people, the, the pilgrims who are gathered in Jerusalem on their pilgrimage, hear these sounds of wind and all of a sudden these chattering people speaking their languages that they can understand, not Greek, that was common, the common language at the time, but their own home languages, and they're curious as to what's going on. They see these Galileans, who unfortunately were the, the hicks or the rednecks of the time, they were speaking their language And verses 12 and 13 records two reactions to this event. Some were touched, and they wanted to know more by saying, what does this mean? What is going on here? Others, of course, ridiculed and claimed that, ah, they're drunk. They've had too much wine. Well, at the two reactions, Peter and the apostles decide that they're not going to hide anymore. They're not going to be afraid anymore. And so they stand up amongst the people gathered, and Peter proclaims his first sermon. It's a good one, I think. He starts off by trying to explain to the people, no, 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 they're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Yeah, I don't, of course, maybe some people drink at nine in the morning, I don't know. But at this time, he argues, no, they're not drunk. It's too early in the morning for that. Instead, Paul defends this event by claiming that they are witnesses to a fulfilled prophecy, a a prophecy given by the prophet Joel. And he quotes it, and he says that God spoke to the prophet Joel and said that at the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon upon his people. And when the Spirit would come, there would be things that we could see. There would be men and women who were prophesying and dreaming dreams. And there were other cosmic disturbances, ultimately, that is going to usher in this, quote, glorious day of the Lord. Now, this glorious day of the Lord is a common theme in the prophets, Basically, the day of the Lord is the day that God will judge the world. But this is not a time to dread, Joel says, because everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved from this judgment. And so Peter, by quoting this prophecy, is claiming that it is now being fulfilled in their hearing and in their presence. God's spirit has been poured out And all of this comes at a key time in history, he says, which Peter now gives in detail. The key event Peter refers to is the time of the Christ, the time of the Messiah. And Peter then launches into his message about Jesus. And in verses 22 through 32, Peter outlines Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And verses 24 through 32 focus primarily on the resurrection of Jesus. If you've been paying attention the last, what, seven weeks, we've been talking about the resurrection and how the resurrection is the key to the Christian message. And I think it's key because it takes up nine verses of Peter's message. And he backs it up, he backs up the resurrection in verses 25 through 28 by quoting a scripture, Psalm 16, 
a psalm of David. And Peter says that David anticipated a resurrection of the dead when he says, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Now Peter admits that it can't be David because David's dead. And he says, well, you can go see his grave over there. So it can't be David, so who does it reference? Who is it in reference to? Well, if it's not David, then it must be David's great son, that being Jesus. And in verse 32, Peter clinches his argument for the resurrection by claiming that he and the others with him have seen it with their own eyes. They are witnesses to the resurrection. And he continues on. The resurrection isn't the end of it. In verses 33 through 35, Peter states that Jesus has now been exalted. He has been placed to the right hand of God, all which means and is connected to the events of Pentecost. And he says, if, with Jesus now exalted, Jesus has received the Holy Spirit from the Father and now gives the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And Peter claims that we can know this because they have seen the evidence in their own eyes. They have heard the wind. They have seen the fire. They have heard the tongues. All of this is before them. And to back it up to make sure he's okay, Peter again quotes from David in Psalm 110, a quote Jesus himself used to explain his identity as the Christ. In this passage that Peter quotes, Peter is seeing God speaking to Jesus, who is identified as David's great son and also his Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, he says. So therefore, if Jesus is David's son and David's Lord, Peter then wraps up his entire sermon by announcing that Jesus is Lord and Christ of all. After his sermon, Luke reports in 37 through 41 the response of the people. Some probably brush it off and think they're still crazy, but some of them are convicted by Peter's sermon and they ask what they must do. And Peter responds, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And he says, if you do this, you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the last seven weeks, beginning on Easter Sunday, I've been trying to talk to you about being witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, not necessarily to the broader world, but at least to our world around Northwest Hills Church. I hope you are beginning to understand a little bit better that each of us are called to be witnesses, to tell people what we know and what we have experienced. We've also realized that this is tough. And the church, not just Northwest Hills, but the church universal tends to struggle to reach out to our neighbors around us. Because ministering to, to people can be challenging, it can be exhausting if we do it on our own. But the truth of Pentecost is that we need the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to fulfill our mission. Before Pentecost, the apostles were afraid. They hid in a house because they did not know what they were supposed to do. They were scrambled. They didn't, they didn't understand. But when the Holy Spirit came upon them and empowered them, that's when they went out and began to preach in Jesus' name. It is by the Spirit that we are capable of fulfilling the mission that Jesus has called his church to do. And throughout the book of Acts, as we've seen, this is the beginning of, of Acts, we've kind of gone back a little bit, but it is the Holy Spirit that, had, that brought the church together and then sent them out in his power. My hope and prayer for us here at Northwest Hills 
is that we experience a new Pentecost moment. I want to pray for each of us that the Holy Spirit may come upon us and fill us so that we may be witnesses of Jesus to our neighbors. And I would encourage you to join me in that prayer. May we pray that the Holy Spirit come again and move among us like he did with the early church. Would you pray with me for that? May we pray. Come, O Holy Spirit, and burn within us again. Come. Amen.